Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. Hi everyone, it's uh, Roxanne Durhodge of Authentic Living with Roxanne. Thanks for tuning in again this week. Uh, today I have a special guest, Eve Doucette. Uh, Eve is from uh, an organization called Dovico and uh, came highly recommended as someone I should have a conversation as I proceed um, to um, research and interview people with um, that pervade the element of authenticity and leadership. And a colleague of mine, Sarah McFannell, suggested uh, Eve quite um, as one of those people that I should be interviewed. So Eve, thanks so much for taking the time to spend with us today. You're welcome, Roxanne. And uh, Sarah, I'll do anything for Sarah. She's amazing. <laughs> she, uh, has, she has that touch point with people for mm -hmm. some. She, yeah, just, she just has that fairy dust. I'm going to call this the Sarah fairy dust that she just kind of drops on you. And, uh, um, and then she just leaves that impact. And she truly... Uh, lives her brand about, um, you know, recognizing greatness. And uh, so when I was speaking to her about what I was um, doing, I'm also in a, a writing kind of accountability uh, course with her, I, I was asking, and then she was so gracious to give me a couple of names of which, of course, uh, yours was uh, one of the ones on the top of the list. Well, I'm glad I'm here. I love talking about um, what I love to do. <laughs> and I uh, and that's lead with love, right? Let's lead with vulnerability. That's leading with, uh, um, you know, positiveness and leading with my authentic self. I often say that there's no two Eve. It's not Eve's with an S because there's an S at the end of my name, but there's only one Eve. There's Eve, the Eve at home and the Eve at work is the same person. There's no, like we try to separate this by saying, well, you, this is the way you behave. You put on a suit, you go to work and you behave this way. And this is, you know, how we treat things like integrity and ethics at home, at work. And then you go home and you behave totally different, right? Mm -hmm. With your family and your friend. And that's impossible for a human to do. You can't separate that. You're just fooling yourself if you do. So, so I want the, I want you as a human, like we have a team of 30, 35 people at Dovaco and um, I'm the culture coach. Prior to that, I was a CEO. I'll give a little bit of background. Let's just start there. I'm an engineer from education. I'm an electrical engineer, so electronic engineer. I design computer software, computer programs, hardware design. Um, that's my education. And um, I'm an entrepreneur by passion. I've started probably 18 companies uh, so far. Uh, not about to stop. Uh, I've had some very big successes. Um, you know, companies have been sold for multi-million dollars, uh, which I was part of. And I've been on board of major companies like uh, Medivy Blue Cross. I was there for 12 mm -hmm. years. Uh, so that's my pedigree thing. Okay, so let's do that. But what I really love is the study of human behaviors and team. And I'm focused on my talent, if I'm going to say this, bragging a bit, my, I'm going to give myself an, account, uh, an acknowledgement. What I really was able to do is build teams that make great things happen. Mm -hmm. right? And I've been studying why that is, why, that, why certain teams work and why certain teams don't work. And how do you get teams to be engaged and how do you get people to change? Like we are facing tremendous change right now. Like mm -hmm. the change we never imagined before. And this has been my, my life passion on how to get teams and people to change, right? And that starts with one thing, and you said it just at the beginning, it starts by being authentic, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and true. It doesn't speak like that's, that there's a difference between that and speaking your truth. That's mm -hmm. different, mm -hmm. right? Being authentic means you're authentic. It's you, it's the real you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, showing up as the real you. Wouldn't yeah. you say though, like, you know, I've been in, in um, corporate consulting for a lot of years and I have, you know, been in leadership roles and I've sat on executive boards and I've reported to executive boards. And 
over the years, you know, it's been, I've been in some sectors, like let's say the legal profession where, you know, it's diametrically opposed to what you're describing right now <laughs> um, at best. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you sit there and, you know, of course, with, with my background and kind of my formal training, I'm a psycho, I was a formally trained psychotherapist that when it ended up in corporate consulting, I could read that, but there is a corporate engagement that happens at certain boards, right? Where I, after a while you're recognizing who's playing what role, who has what power, who can say and who can't say which is sometimes not, it works at cross purposes to what we're discussing right now. Would you say that that's coming along on boards or are you saying that this subset of authenticity and leadership is something that's, that's gotten better in the tenure since you've acted in the various senior roles that you've played in companies? Let's start with the legal profession for a second because I've, play, I've had my, and if you Google my name, you've just said lawsuit, you'll find me. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So I spent, after I've, I was very, this is a bit of my story and it's in my book. Okay. And what, uh, what is your book, Eve? I did not. Oh, I am a seed. I am a seed. Okay. I would, I'm going to have to pick that up. Yeah. And um, I can send you a copy if you want. Okay, great. And um, yeah, so I built this big company. It was called Spiel at the time. I helped build that company. I was one of the founders. And after nine years in that company, the uh, major shareholder decided to fire me, mm -hmm. which I thought was unfair. So I sued. And for nine or 10 years, I was in court. I guess I guess this giant, right? And then I lost. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I lost big time. I mean, like it was the fine I got was the highest fine ever given to a Canadian citizen mm -hmm. or to a corporation, right? And... I was 52 at the time mm. and I owed like millions of dollars that I didn't have. I didn't have, I have nothing left, right? Nothing at all. And up to that point, I hadn't lost anything in my life. I was very successful. You know, I was very lucky, uh, great parents, great family, great friends, like great education, very lucky, right? Very, very blessed on this earth. And then I crashed like an airplane like I crushed. And then I started to look at what's wrong. Why did I lose? Like I'm calculated. Everything I do is calculated. That's what engineers do. And I realized that I lost because the whole legal system is not authentic. And I wasn't authentic in that system. Mm. That's why I lost. It, it, wasn't, it didn't matter that I had all the facts. It didn't matter that I had good lawyers. It didn't matter that I had the evidence. It didn't matter that I had the law with me because I did. Mm -hmm. What mattered is that I wasn't authentic mm -hmm. and the system is not authentic. Mm -hmm. And we live in a world and you want to, you want to dive into this. Just look at what's going on today in our leadership. So I'm not going to point to anybody here, but you just have to go on any news media. Mm -hmm. And you look at what's happening to the leadership today and lying is acceptable, mm -hmm. right? And lying is acceptable in court. It's acceptable in our businesses. It's acceptable by our leaders. And we accept that as part of leadership. And we wonder why we're broken. We wonder why people aren't engaged. We wonder why people aren't showing up to work and they're switching jobs. We wonder why people don't believe us anymore. We wonder why people don't want to follow me. Yeah. And there I was alone, right? And I thought, that's not leadership. I'm just taking a walk by myself, yelling and nobody's following. I wasn't authentic. And I became authentic and vulnerable. And I started to be like on, on social media, I said, well, I've lost everything, including my name, because I was the news at that time. So I decided to post on social media, a video, right? About being vulnerable, my stories, like every story. And I go from one video a day, sorry, one video a week for five minutes to one video a day. They do one a day now on the most social medias. And it's one minute to two minutes, right? And it's about what I've learned for today being very vulnerable. Mm. And my discovery in that 
because at that time, I, I knew a lot of stuff, but I didn't feel a lot of things, right? Mm. And it was easy to make stuff, but I was just a commodity like everybody else, right? Because I wasn't authentic. So that's kind of my spiel on the legal system. I think the legal system, being a lawyer, being an, like even us, um, and I, I'm in court, I'm not in court, but in battles once in a while, you're in business, people accuse you of stuff. So you, and I lead totally differently. When we get, we have to let go people, I don't call in the lawyers. Mm -hmm. I actually go sit down with a person and say, okay, this is not working out. We're not meant for each other. I love what you're doing. You have great talent. It's just not, it's not going the right way. Why don't you find another job, right? Right, right. right? So unless you're a danger to me, that's what I do, mm -hmm. right? So you shifted in your perspective from this really adverse situation and it made you come to that space of authenticity that now you shifted in the world with what you showed. Yeah, I remember, I remember the uh, chief justice coming to us and they were trying to mitigate this before we get to court, right? So they do this, which is good. They try to mitigate it and, because nobody wins in a war, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody wins in court. Like both, both sides got buried. Like that's what happens. So Chief Justice comes to us and he says to us, he says, I can't believe all the things you're saying against these, these adversaries you got. They have a good name. And I'm thinking, well, I have a good name. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with my name? It's at that moment that I realized that my responsibility was to stand up for something. And I hadn't done so. I didn't have a name. Mm -hmm. I didn't stand for anything, right? And it's at that moment that I realized that my responsibility is to stand up and say what I stand for, what I want to discover in other people, be the change I wanted to see in the world. And it's at that moment that I realized that really business is really like, it's, it's been great managing the way we've been managing for years. It's taken us to this point, but it could take us no further. That's why we have a broken system. Greed has taken over the system. The bigger, the richer are getting richer, and there's no money, there was no, no money left for the small businesses. It's really difficult now. And it's because we have managed ourselves to a point that there's no other thing we could do mm -hmm. logically. There's no other tactics you can use to make people work harder. It doesn't work anymore. There's no other you know, management skills that you can do to get people more engaged. It doesn't work anymore, right? And the millennials, they know this more than anybody else. And you think they know it. Wait until the next generation. Mm -hmm. They're really going to know it. There's no way you can attract anything. There's no way you can get people to work for you. There's no way they're going to get people to stay for you, like for that long, unless you're not authentic, unless you're not leading with what you love and what you stand for. So when that judge told me that, I thought, okay, I get it now. I've learned something. Mm -hmm. Cool. <laughs> Wasn't a waste of time, right? Okay. <laughs> And I decided to, I, I was going to be authentic and vulnerable, right? For everybody to see. And something magical happened. Now we make probably, we make timesheet software. Now next to our garbage can, we're probably very sexy, but that's about that, right? Who wants to come and work for a timesheet company? Nobody that I know went to school, like <laughs> studied a PhD in timesheet software, like how to fill in a time card. It's the last thing every single person done every week, and they hate it. Why would you want to come? It kind of goes, oh no, headache and timesheet, oh, right? Oh my, oh my god, another it's, one. It's oh, due, it's like, right? <laughs> so who would want to do that? And worse, working for a timesheet company, like, like let me put my hair out. Like, there's nothing as boring as that. It's even more boring than filling in the timesheet. You're making software to fill in the timesheet. How boring is that? And at that time, we could not get, like we had a trouble getting a graduate from community college to come work for us. Like it was really hard to get anybody come to work for us. These young people, they get it right away. There's no way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And once I started to be vulnerable and authentic, so on social media, and we started to do our Facebook Live because every Monday morning we have a meeting just like Mr. Uh, Walt, I forget his last name, the guy who invented the Walmart what? Um, um, Walton? Yeah, right. Yeah, he did. He was doing his weekly meeting, but we do it live. Mm -hmm. So we do a, a Monday morning live 
every meeting on Facebook. You can just tune in at 9.30 and see us, me and Shelly will have a talk with something, right? Wow. And we started to do that. Once we started to do that, people started to apply. So your Facebook Live is where? It's, it's available to anybody or is it just to the Dovico, yeah. empl- to, to Dovico employees? No, no, to everybody. Just anybody. to go on live. So if I go on to um, Dovico. Dovico on Facebook, I can see a live 9.30 tomorrow morning. On Monday morning. Monday morning. Okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tune in to see that. Yeah, yeah you'll see a live. Yeah. Okay, okay. We'll talk about things. I don't know what, like every week is different. We'll talk about something. Okay, yeah. okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, so once we started to do that, people started to apply to the point that now we have three master's degrees working for us, right? Mm. We have the top, like I'm talking about the, the top performers in each class, like 4.0 grade average are coming apply for us. Right? They're, they're working for us. We, <laughs> we have, um, like we have such an amazing crew, like we have the best. And we don't advertise for jobs, Hmm. right? So if your goal as a leader is to get engagement and to get people to come and work for you and stay there because our tenure is like 20 years. Like most people, nobody leaves. I ask people to leave, but nobody (laughs) leaves. Yeah. Sometimes I have to ask people to leave because it doesn't work, but nobody has left. Very few people, a few, we had two this year, like that left, but very few people leave, right? So why is that? I got to say relational transparency, which is one of the elements in the research, right? Here I am. This is who we are. This is who, what we represent. This is Eve. This is Shelly. And then you just talk. Like you could probably have a conversation like we're having now. And you're not, you're not, you're not hiding anything, which, which is oftentimes what you're talking to. When I was um, in corporate consulting, um, there definitely were secrets and I could see it as the, you know, as the consultant coming in. But of course I had a dual role. I had the role to be the consultant that was um, reporting on trending analysis of what, what kind of things keep people away from work um, from the end user. And then I was reporting to management or in, in some capacity. So I had to basically, you know, teeter totter between, okay, that's not going to be discussed. So I guess I'll, I'll slant my data just to be able to, you know, to some degree, because I had to represent the company that I was working for, even though in the sector, I was seeing certain trends that clearly, you know, you can't retain, say, female lawyers at age 32 if they're on um, tenure track because they've probably just started their family. So what are you going to do to change that? And of course, based on the sector, the recommendations fell up on deaf ears. And then, yeah, it's not you know, true. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you know. and people smell that. See, we're like babies are, are amazing. They, they read your face. They look at your eyes and they say, I trust you or I don't trust you, like that. Mm-hmm. And we're the same way, mm-hmm. right? So trust is the most important thing in leadership. And if you're not authentic to your own self, I mean, showing up as you are vulnerable, and sharing vulnerability and sharing what you your what you love to do and what you stand for without making any justification for it, right? Then you're not going to build trust. But I'm going to play devil's advocate for a bit here. Like you know the state of the world right now, and yeah. you know what's happening, and you see, and we won't get into names or anything, that some of the most powerful people sometimes are incongruent if there's in their space of authenticity. How? But, but, some, but so these people, the reason they have followers, that's a question, is yes. because, because they know exactly what he is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Like everybody knows, there's no surprise. Like that's yeah. what he is. Yeah. I'm the best in the world at doing this, whatever. Well, I don't, that's too detailed, but he, yeah. when you show up as authentic, right? That's when you get a leader. Now, is it a good leader? No, that's something different, right? Mm. So, so long as you're being transparent in the space that you want yeah. to live in, you yeah. have followers accordingly, which is different from what we're talking about in authentic leadership with productivity and trust is a completely different thing. It's different. Like yeah. you can be authentic, right? Like some of the, like Hitler was a great leader. <laughs> yeah, he was. Right? 
like not a great leader, sorry. He was a leader. People right. followed him. Why did they follow him? Because he was authentic, right? And he spoke to something that spoke to them. Mm -hmm. And he believed what he believed. He yeah. believed that, you know, they were the best in the world. And so the people that believe that, they just followed him. And he believed that. He was authentic about that, right? Like that's, like, that's the real person. Is that, does that make a good leader? No, obviously not, right? You need more than that. You need, you need to lead. So that's like, I would equate that to Darth Vader, finding the force, right? And using it for ill, right? right. Absolutely. So once you find the, the force, which is authenticity, then you have to use it for good. <laughs> because if you lead it for greed or for ill, like you're just like Darth Vader, right? <laughs> you're just not good, right? But authenticity and vulnerability is a leadership skill. And if you want to use it to manipulate, I can give you a list of people who do that constantly just to make money or to manipulate you or to change you. You know, manipulation using authenticity is the same thing as manipulation using the whip and the candy. So here's a candy. Here's a candy, meaning I'm going to give you a bonus, right? If you do it this way. And here's a whip. If you don't do it this way, you're fired, right? Mm -hmm. That is also manipulation. Absolutely. Right? So using authenticity to manipulate you, I'm going to go on stage and present to some people and cry, tell you how my sob story and how I risen from the dead to survive. That is also manipulation. Mm -hmm. That is not being authentic to the heart, right? Yeah. Pure. And you're right, because we can read it. I can read you and I know you can read me. We're, we've never met, um, but I can read you. Because yeah, I, I, I have a sense of what you're about, just based on, on that space that you're, you're creating for me, Eve. And I, I'm assuming you're, you're reading the same with me. Now, you, you brought something up. And I really, I actually just um, yesterday interviewed a millennial uh, leader. And, okay. um, and we're talking about new leadership, right? And, and we're talking about coming up right behind them are the Gen Zs who, you know, are entering into a, this phase. These people that are coming out of their... Uh, undergrads or the graduate degrees now, and they're entering the wo workforce. And you're you're there, you know, in this um, you know growing company where you're getting people to come to you after doing Facebook Lives and stuff like that. What do you think these Zeds are gonna? What are they gonna be needing from companies and leaders to be able to? I, I, we're, we're on uncertain time, right? Like right now, we're on uncertain time. Yeah. But, but they're the next wave of, our, um, it, of, of these, our, these people that we need to attract and retain. Yeah, I think the millennials, because they've been birthed. So people learn two ways, right? They learn by storytelling, which is what we do about behavior. So millennials have been birthed by society as a whole. So they are more attuned to consciousness than we ever had, that, that I have, that my generation was. Absolutely mine too. I just kind of went along and then, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, exactly. Like you, you do this track, you go to school, you go to university, you get good grades, you get a master's, you get good grade, you get a job, you get promoted. That's how it worked, right? It doesn't work like that anymore. And these millennials, they know this. And there's a revolution going on. And the revolution is about consciousness, awareness. And it's led by women. Mm -hmm. Like you just look, like you, if you, if you turn off the news and you look, you listen to what's going on. There's an awakening going on here and it's consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening. So these millennials are looking for companies that are conscious, mm -hmm. which is different than authenticity, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, but you need to be authentic to be conscious, <laughs> right? So, what so is the, al the alignment's going to come, though. So at some point, yeah. if yeah. they're conscious and they're looking at the world and they're, they're now entering, let's say, into, into a space of, okay, I'm starting my career. I'm now you know, launching into adulthood and where I'm going to start my career. Um, they're going to be looking for certain things in companies um, that's going to make them decide if, whether they're going to, submit their time to grow with those companies or if they're just yeah. gonna if they're gonna you know piggyback and keep going yeah so the first question they're gonna ask is can i trust you mm -hmm. can i trust my manager so they're interviewing you you're not interviewing them they're going to a job interview and they're looking at you and say can i trust you right that's the question they're asking 
And what a completely diametrically opposed um, interview that was to, for, for when I went for my first job, right? I was like, okay, I was educated and still I was like, okay, I, I hope I'm in alignment with what they need. And now it's like, oh, no, 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 hold on. These uh, Zeds are going to say, well, okay, tell me about what this company is going to do for the environment or what, how are they going to, um, you know, align with what I value? Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't help any that you're, you're, you're giving money to the United Way. Like they see right through that BS. They see right through that. Like that's not going to work at all. <laughs> Forget that. It doesn't work that you have a pool table at work either. They're going to see through that because they know that when push comes to shove, right? If something happens, they're going to get really like hurt as their fathers and their mothers have done. They've learned this. So they're looking for things that you're not even giving them. They're not, they're looking for things that are more fundamental to the uh, Maslow hierarchy of needs, mm -hmm. right? They have no fear. They, have, they don't worry about money or like their house or where they're going to live. What they're worried about is, are you conscious? Mm -hmm. Are you going to be fair? Are you going to treat me fairly? Are you going to treat other people fairly? Am I proud to work for you? Yeah, they're going to be looking for that. And you can't achieve that if, you're, if you don't have authenticity. Yeah, and you can't achieve that if you're not having vulnerable. And you can't achieve that if you are not truly it, like leading from a place of, of giving, right? Mm -hmm. What does that have to do with business? Lead with love. That's our mantra at Dovago. People don't buy products. They buy from people. And they happen to say, what do you do again? I like you. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, I know somebody. And, and if you think of every person you pass on, like we're talking about, you know, Sarah as a, as a role model. Um, and, you know, Sarah and I, my paths have crossed because of the speaking industry and coaching. And, um, you know, we're both professional speakers. And, you know, we keep kind of bumping up against each other. But that's not the reason I connected with her because it's, it's because she is so authentic and, yeah, and you yeah. know, and the energy, right? And how can I, how can I serve? Yeah. Servant leadership, right? Like that whole concept of how can I help you out, Roxanne? You know, how can I, how can I be of service? I met this, um, I went to see this, I won't name the company, but I went to see this local company and uh, he was showing me that they had just moved into an office space that was occupied by a real estate company. And they had set up these, these closets, they called them offices, right? But they were actually the size of a closet. So you stood in that closet as an, as an employee. They had a mirror and they had a little tablet. So you stood to it, get energy and you could put your tablet on there. So when you called prospects, <laughs> they had trained them to smile because they said, if you smile at yourself, people will know that you're smiling. <laughs> but you're in a closet, <laughs> right? So, so they took a theory, quantum mm -hmm. physics, that right. actually you talked about, we can feel the energy through the air, you can. Yes, yes. That's why you hooked up with Sarah. You can yes. feel her energy. I can feel her energy right now, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I can yes. feel that. That's quantum physics. We're all made of energy. I'm a scientist, so let's go with that, right? Let's yes. go through scientists. So quantum physics is like, you have energy, we have energy. But if you're fake smiling, everybody knows. <laughs> everybody course. knows that your energy is transmitted through your voice, through your words. Mm -hmm. If you're giving a presentation, if you're a, public, you're a public speaker, you know that when you're going out there and your energy is out of love and giving, like you're going to be received like a queen because mm -hmm. you're authentic. When you speak from the heart, right, mm -hmm. you're going to have a different experience than when you speak from a, I got to perform point of view mm -hmm. right and it's it, you know it's so true because even as my my junior training when i was interning to be a psychotherapist um you know that's what they taught us to do was to really um you know they literally would sometimes um say to us they would want us to close our eyes and just listen to what the client was saying yeah. and then we would have to do what we call process logs which where we would have to describe intuitively, Eve, what we were experiencing in our body, 
from the words of the clients. Yeah, I love it. Right. And without, you know, and I'd be like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm, 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 I'm 19, 20 years old. I'm like, there's no way of, at that developmental stage and where I was at. My, I'm like, there's no way I'm going to do this. But again, we all have that capacity. But, you know, to be able to, you know, of course, you know, 25 years later, absolutely. Like, I mean, what they were yeah. teaching me then was a gift that most 20 year olds, you know, wouldn't have experienced. But now, the value of being able to just be across from someone and experience them. And when, you know, and then you, you think, I already know that person. I have, I barely yeah. exchanged much, but I can get a sense. And if that's what we're talking about with, um, you know, the new generation and they're looking for consciousness, they're going to, they're going to be feeling that intuitively because they're, they're at almost like a high level of uh, capacity already yeah. um, based on where, where they're coming in from. I love this, right? Because I published, I do a quote every day too. And one of the quotes I, I published not too long ago is that the body knows before the mind does. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And that's speaking to that term. Mm -hmm. Like we, we, we look with our eyes, we should be looking with our bodies. It has all these senses, like the feeling, yes. the smell, the energy, all that is inside of our bodies. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to compute with our eye, our brain. Mm -hmm. We're trying to see what our brain is. That doesn't work. It doesn't work because it's based on biases. Absolutely. Of your past experiences, right? Right. And you try to kind of, you know, ignore them, push them away. So let's, uh, let's, let's talk, let's go back again to conscious leadership. Okay. And what, you know, I, I know what you, you know, you're talking about Facebook lives and attracting these people and what, like people are like probably listening kind of just gone virtual and are thinking, well, how do I, how do I do that? How do I create a conscious space? Cause now, you know, a lot of companies uh, globally have been forced to kind of take their teams virtual. Some of them have never been teams to begin with. Some of them have never been virtual. I know you at Dovico are ahead of the curve in that you've been already been virtual and stuff like that. How does a company that's thinking, Oh my goodness, I just, the fact that I still have to, you know, inform productivity. I'm not seeing my people anymore. We, we barely have much of a culture and you're the culture guy. How, how do they, what kind of things can they start to implement? And I'm not meaning in a false way to at least show that they're trying to learn, even though they haven't been authentic with their connection previous. That's a good question. Um, I would say if you're the, are you asking if you're the leader of that company? Yeah. If you're the leader and uh, you know, yeah. You're now having, you know, to put, maybe go to your layer of your senior VPs that ha then have to re have their teams report, you know, so you're, you're needing to, to uh, pilfer or filter down that element of, of uh, authenticity to your senior leadership team, who in turn would have teams reporting to them. Yeah, so I would say if you're, you can do Zoom, like Zoom is this, you don't have to go on social media, you can do privately like this. We also have Facebook Live privately in a group, so you can do that. You can do FaceTime. There's so many tools. You can do phone calls, yeah. You can do an email. You can do a blog. You can do – there are so many ways to communicate. It's not the communication that's important. It's what you say in the communication. Mm -hmm. And I would say be authentic by saying be vulnerable, right? Leaders today, need, they need to be vulnerable. They need to be saying, okay – this is how I'm working today. This is what I'm worried about. And if you're worried that people are, yeah, if you're worried that people are not engaged, well, you say that. I worry that I'm not doing a good job in engaging you. You just say that. You say what's on your heart, right? Yes. yes. Like you say what you feel like. That, so go against, I would say do the opposite of what you've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so because, and then like, okay, so not everybody can go out there and like open their kimono and say, hey, so how do you build authenticity, mm -hmm. right? And remember, and you know this, Roxanne, you practice, whatever you practice, you become. Absolutely. Right? So how do you, you don't want one day to say, I'm going to be authentic today. <laughs> That's not the way it works. Like you don't go and say, I'm going to go skiing today and then you go down a double diamond. You're going to get killed. Don't do that. Right? So take small steps. Mm -hmm. Practice authenticity with people that are closer to you. Mm -hmm. Right? Inner circle. 
then build that circle up so that you can actually practice being authentic and being vulnerable and being true, being yourself. And then close your eyes once you've done it and see how it feels. When you've said something that's on your mind, that's in your heart, and you've said it, monitor how it feels, yeah. And I always say that when you go to the gym, don't go to the gym and measure your muscles or how you weight or if you've lost weight. Measure how you feel. Mm -hmm. And if you just close your eyes and say, this, is, this workout feels good, right? Or if you just said something to a person that you needed to say because you're afraid of something or you have doubts about something and you say it and you measure how you feel. And if it feels authentic, you will know. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like ego. It feels like, like your body is actually re, like reconstructing yourself. Like it feels different than ego. Ego feels like I just punched you in the face and I'm happy with that. Mm -hmm. That's not being authentic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So really it's, 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 if you haven't been, um, you know, and I often say anybody can develop it you know, um, that ability to listen and to, th yeah. you know, and, and read the nonverbals and, you know, have people go along like talking heads and you're thinking, oh my God, they, they don't like a thing coming out of my mouth, but because you're the leader, they're going along. But I, th I like that concept of starting with people that are closer to you because the people closer to you are kind of tell you the way it is. They're like, oh, no, you're not good at this, or you should try more of this, or I don't like how you do, you know, I, I, I completely... Because those are the people that know you who, for who you are. And then you can build from that. Because with my um, work with my uh, corporations that I've done is I have created a two-way assessment that when leaders are, let's say they have a direct team that reports to them, the leader is doing the authenticity assessment at the same time that their team is doing it for them. Then we collate the information accordingly. And then we look at really what are the true skills that have to be worked on. And as they continue along and they, we train them, we have um, ongoing assessment to see how, okay, if I've taught you a bit about, um, you know, the ability to be more relationally transparent and you've gotten content and you've been able to work on it, but that score is not going up. That's telling us something's not jiving there. Yeah. But, you know, so we're trying to kind of see, okay, this is what you've been working on. This is what you've learned. This is what you've practiced. Now let's check with your, your team to see if that's increased. And if it hasn't increased, that means that we're missing something. Yeah. Yeah. Those um, soft skills are hard to measure. Yes. <laughs> they are definitely. They're hard to measure, right? And um, Yeah. <laughs> But at the center of all of them, all the soft skills, trust, authenticity, uh, trust, what else? I don't know, leadership, you know, innovation, I don't know, engagement. There's one thing to me anyway, and that's the art of communication. Mm -hmm. And the art of communication starts like this. You ask a question and you breathe. <laughs> <laughs> Very basic, yes. Right? And if you're focused on the breathing, you're not focusing on talking. So you breathe. You take, like, you would do ujjayi breath, like long breath in, very long breath out to the belly. You put your hand on your belly. Mm -hmm. You practice Kalini yoga, so you know this, right? Yeah, that you create space. Mm -hmm. And then when you create space, you let the other people fill that space with something which is what you need to listen to. And then you breathe again. So at least three or four breaths. So you ask a question and then you let, let space fill in. Don't fill it with stuff. Let it fill. Yeah. Stay in the uncomfortable myth of the pose, like we'd say in yoga, right? Yes. It's very uncomfortable to say nothing. That's where magic happens. You create tapas or heat. And so you stay in that, yeah, stay in that. And then ask the same question again differently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and then breathe. <laughs> and something magical happens with that. The art of conversation happens. Yeah. And yeah, it, so what happens when you give, a, you give space, right? You have, you're, you're letting people build trust. You're letting people talk. 
and say what you need to say. And you're in discovery of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you're in discovery of that, everything else kind of flows. Authenticity, like trust, leadership. Yeah. Because you're getting closer because the person felt is feeling heard. Right? So and feeling valuable in their space that they bring value to, to the conversation, to the space, to the project, uh, to the relationship, all those things. Yeah. So then they're open and then they think, you know, I connect with you, Roxanne, what do you need from me as a leader? If I'm kind of, you know, checking the dots, kind of ticking off what I had to do that day versus kind of feeling like what needs to be done because this is my team. This is yeah. so important and I want to do the best because I want my team to shine and I want to make um, my leader know how important it is for me that we, we're doing the best. If I'm, if I'm open hearted, I'm going to do my best. But if I'm kind of thinking, oh, you know, she's going to check and make sure I did this or that. She's always checking my work or micromanaging me or those types of things that close off, you know, the space that someone brings to, to, to work. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, people feel that. Mm -hmm. They feel that you're not authentic. Mm -hmm. It's not like the skill has to be developed from inside, not from the outside they feel they're not authentic because you're micromanaging them. Because as you're listening, you're thinking, oh, you should be doing this. Mm -hmm. But then you're not listening. You're not ready in the present if you're doing that. Yeah, the present, yeah, right, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, Eve, let me ask you a question. As a leader, how, do you, hmm. how would you gauge whether um, someone's authenticity when it increases how would be the, what would be the metrics as a company that they should look at to decide if someone's connection or authenticity is actually increasing productivity it, oh know. sorry oh you you added something at the end there productivity so can at you the end of, the question so i want to know right let's say i'm i'm you know one of your leaders and i have been struggling and i've been really working on increasing being authentic and available and more communicative those types of things and you're putting me through a coaching or a training program and you're going to kind of look at whether my impact my changes have increased productivity what kind of metrics would you look at at say for instance dobico or any other company to decide if my skill enhancement has improved, improved productivity. Well, you asked me if I had enough time, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I told you I have time. Yes. Yes. So I have time because I don't have people. I used to run a company and they made me this little statuette there. I got to find it for you. Uh, yeah. So they made me this little statuette. It's, can you see that? Yes, I can. It's a guy on the trunk on that, <laughs> right? You see it? He's on, on the, the toilet phone. with on a, yeah, phone. <laughs> on a phone. And if you look at the phone, it's not one of these modern phones. It was made like 25 years ago. Oh, that's the one the, with the first big uh, yeah, phone. A shoe phone. They get smartphone. Like that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So 25 years ago, I was known to be busy. Mm. And people were lined up in my office, like lined up. I could hardly take a holiday. I remember one day I was in our local park here, Kuchirak Park with my wife and we're canoeing. We're out there like probably, I don't know, I don't know, a kilometer out. A police officer on a bullhorn comes over and says, Eve Doucette, there's an emergency. Oh my God, so I'm rowing, I'm rowing, I'm rowing. I get there, I'm like I'm done, right? There was an emergency at work on a Friday, on a Sunday, sorry, right? And I call and I'm fucking thinking, I can't get one bit of rest here and people come to find me, right? People come to find me. Last year, I took six weeks of holidays, not one phone call, not one email. Mm -hmm. We increased sales. We developed products. The team showed up. They hired people without me knowing. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> I think you've answered my question. Yeah. Right. So you in developing a certain style of leadership allowed others to function 
and and feel comfortable in the space to lead on their own yeah. and know that they will be okay because they they know that you trust their skills right mm. right so they trust me how does trust start like let's start with that mm. how do you earn trust by discovering it in other people mm-hmm. by discovering what you can trust in other people and pointing that out, you discuss, you discuss trust and you become trustable. It's earned, not, it's not something you developed, like, mm-hmm. like, but you can find it. And when you find it in other people, you will actually develop it in yourself. That's how trust is built. Right? So, right. Like when this pandemic happened, it took us at least 30 seconds to react. Well, when I was having that conversation about your teams and I, I, and I'm like, so what, how did you have to pivot? And she goes, well, you know, we didn't really have to pivot. We have our coffee trains and I'm, and I'm like, and I'm like talk, yeah, yeah. So all those things that she, you know, I know from a lot of uh, interviews that I've been doing with, with uh, different leaders and coaches, uh, a lot of people are struggling, even that have already had virtual teams. Yeah, but we practice right, change, because of, right? Like, how do you, you pro- remember I said, whatever you want, whatever you practice, you become. So every yeah. year, everybody at Dovico has an office. Mm-hmm. We don't have a, ver- we don't have a cubicles. There's nobody has cubicles. Mm-hmm. Everybody has an office. For the most part, everybody has an office with a door that can sh- close and lock and a window. Mm. Why? Our payroll is the biggest component of anything. If you're not productive, right? for one hour times 35 people, right? Mm-hmm. That's a waste of a lot of money. I calculated everything. Right. For you to be productive, you need a space that you can go there and feel safe and feel valued, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then we have a common kitchen. Everybody, you, you have to come out through the kitchen. So that's why we, like, we bump into each other, mm-hmm. right? That's how we bump into each other. We practice yoga, that's how we bump into each other. We have team meetings, that's how we bump into each other. But we practice change. Every year, for example, I'll give you a small one, right? Why could we pivot? Every year, everybody changes office. They change offices? Yeah. Like, so do you do like a merry-go-round with offices or do you? No, there's somebody that's in charge. It's not me. Her name okay. is Felicia. And Felicia has the job to change the people's office. Interesting. And she has carte blanche. She can change anybody. Like I'm just because I'm the founder of the company doesn't mean I get a window or I get a special office. It means everybody changes office. Yeah. Fascinating. Not- I, I have never heard of that before. And I, I love it. But aren't there people that don't like change that are saying, oh, no, 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 Eve, you can't do this to me this year again. Is there, did you, do you ever get people feeling like that? And other people are saying, oh, just put me wherever. Oh. <laughs> of course, Roxanne. At the beginning, when we were doing it, I had a new me. You know, I said, "Well, I want to," and I'm thinking, if you can't change office because you can't work because you're closer to the photocopier or the water cooler or the bathroom or whatever it is, yeah. like if you can't figure that out, right? What's going to happen if you have a pandemic? Mm. All right? right? Yeah. So you have to. Pro- the one thing. Is, there's two things that are certain in life, and you don't answer this question. Yes, Boxes I do. And, and what? Yeah, and death. And change, right? Change or death. Change. Yeah, the change, yeah. right? Yes, yeah. yes. Death, too. Those are three things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The third, yeah. Well, I mean, if you think of the term VUCA, right, which is yeah. like, I mean, that's what we're living. That's what we're living now. And most people don't know what to do with this whole concept of change to your point. They're like, we don't know. We don't know what's coming. Everybody's in a panic mode. Everybody is, is, is reacting from a place of fear versus, okay. We, like you said, if I've already been practicing this, I'm like, okay, so what yeah. I know what, it, yeah, I know what it is to, to, to function and in, in, in a nonlinear way. So I'm going to be good with this. We'll just have to figure out what the terrain's going to look like. And that sounds like something that you've been doing at Dovico over and over again. Yeah. Like we have, um, so we started with that small one, right? Yeah. Practice change. So that's a small thing. Let's practice changing that. Mm-hmm. Like it's nothing to change an office, right? Now I'm right. um, the CEO. Shelly's the CEO now. Like she changed too. Right. Everybody changes. And Shelly doesn't get to pick her office. And neither do I. Nobody gets to pick the office. Wow. Felicia picks the office. That's her job. And her job is to create change. 
right? That's what she does, yeah. Now that's a small movement, right? Mm -hmm. So why is that important? Because you can't go from zero to skiing down the double, double diamond trails. You have to start by going down the bunny hill, right? right. And you know that mm -hmm. from a physicalness point of view. Well, the mind's no better. Mm. The mind's the same thing. You can't go from trusting to trusting. You can't go from authenticity, like you can't go over there. And you can't go from change, mm. right? You have to start in small steps. So we start small, right? Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So we've, we've got a project, a, um, program called Courage. Have you heard of this? No, I have not. Shelly yeah. did not share that with me. Yeah, so we have a program called Courage. Mm -hmm. So Courage, <laughs> uh, the intention is more important than the business, okay? Mm -hmm. The intention is more important than the business. The intention is more important than the, than the program. Okay. Okay? The name, right? The intention is the name of the program. So it's okay. called courage. So what's okay. the intention of courage? To be, to be more courageous. Courage, right. What are the rules? There's two rules. You must do something that is courageous, okay? And it must not cost more than $3,000. And every employee has access to that once a year. Wow. Okay. So what is courage for you? I don't know. Right. Well, so everybody's got it. So we have three authors that wrote, that wrote, wrote books. We have a guy that was going to run the marathon. His name is Jeff. And his fear was crossing the Golden Gate Gate Bridge. He was molested when he was young. Mm. And all he had a picture. I'm going to cry here. He had a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. And that was his fear. Wow. And he became a marathon runner last year. And he said, you know what? I want to run a marathon crossing the Golden, Great, uh, Golden Gates Bridge. Wow. That was his fear. My sister, she has five kids at home, right? And she doesn't pamper herself. Her fear was getting pampered. So she decided to book a day off and go get pampered in a spot. Wow. You cannot imagine the discussion I had with that girl. Now she's like super like a successful leader, like strong, courageous, but she could not do that, mm. right? So I said to her, I said, Diane, I've already booked it. It's already all set, you have to go. And she was finding excuses after excuses after excuses, yeah. Mm. And she, she sat there all day and she discovered something she never knew before, herself. We have, um, what else do we have? We have one of our, well, he can't go now, but he was planning to go back home to South Korea. He yeah. left an estranged family there and he wanted to go back and mend, mend, mend his way with his family member. I don't know what courage is. Can you, can you tell me what courage is? Oh my goodness. So courage is, is walking into something that you're petrified about and taking, I, okay. So this is how, this is my analogy that I use. It's like, I know I got to do this. I'm going to go through a tunnel and I'm going to take each step that I'm going to take. I'm going to hope there's a bit of light so yeah. I'm, so I can take that next step and not back up. I'm going to, I'm just going to go, you know, a right. bit at a time and hope to God that there's what I'm looking for is on the other end and that I know I will be okay. So, so what does courage have to do with running a company that's engaged and full of vitality and innovation? It creates connection. Yeah. You Absolutely. take risk, right? Yeah. Take because I, yeah. I, I say, I, I, you know, in uh, kind of my tagline for my brand, I said, it's not about ROI. It's about ROR, which is return on relationship versus return yeah. on investment, yeah. which is exactly what you're talking. You're saying to your employees, go out and do something. And what, what happens when we, we, you have to be vulnerable and you're scared um, and you're taking that step, but then ultimately you achieve it, but you're achieving it in a, in the context of a system that's validating yeah. that says, yeah. Wow, you did it. Yeah. Who came up with this concept, Steve? I did, yeah. You yeah. did. Is it, in your, is it in your book? Not in this book. So uh, what happened, I'll tell you the story. What happened is I, I'm really against manipulation, right? So when you look at, like, there's no 
I'm not measuring the return on investment on courage. You can't. Yeah. But I know that if you practice courage, you will become courageous in your life, your personal life, and in your business life. That means to me that if you're programming, right, you will have the audacity to do something you never did before, right? Mm, yeah, of course. Because you're practicing courage, right? So what happens, I, I turn 60. I decide that I wanted to become, I've been practicing yoga for five years, six years. I, I think this is great. I'm getting awareness. I'm getting these ideas. And this is fantastic. So I find this program, it's called Baptiste Yoga. And it's the one that has one week. Of, well, you can go for one week. I think this is perfect. I can go for one week and nobody's going to say anything, right? And my mom is, my dad is so religious. They're very religious. So like, of course, yoga is not clearly religion. You know, it's not the yes. same thing. I might get invaded by the devil or something, right? Like, mm, my family's not into yoga. My wife is going to say something. My friends are going to, what are my friends going to say? My, my, my guy friends, like yoga. Like, what are you <laughs> doing? Like, you're 60 years old, like, right? I booked this trip and I don't want to go. Shelly comes to me and says, you're going, I booked you. You're done. First trip in my life that I ever took in my, myself pleasure, right? It's in Tulum, Mexico. It's a beautiful place. And it changed my life. It changed the way I managed a company. It changed the way I saw things. It changed the way I saw myself. I, I stayed there for an extra week, week. I wrote this book while I was there. And I come back into Dovaco and I say, holy shit, I want everybody to go do yoga. And I thought, wrong. What I got from that is that it took everything I had to go do and become a teacher, a yoga teacher. That took courage. I want people to have courage. I want people to do what they want to do. I don't want the people to live with regrets. I don't want people to live with coming over and say, I wish I would have done that. I want you to have the facility to do that. And I thought, what is the one thing that removes like a barrier? Money. Mm -hmm. and permission. So I'm going to give you permission to do whatever you want. And I'm going to give you some money for it. Now, what's your excuse? Don't have any. Go do it. You've removed right? it. And we celebrate it without judgment. There's no, because I know if you practice courage, you will become courage. Mm -hmm. And it's, it spreads like wildfire, this thing. It's weird. <laughs> I, could, I could just imagine. And then having people come back from these um, events or activities and, and just what space they must bring back. You're right. How do you, how do you quantify that? Qualitatively, I'm sure people are in cloud nine and they're you know, feeling like so elevated. And that, again, translates into energy. And, we're, and we, we know we are attracted to like energy. So yeah. if that's the space you're creating in, in, in Dovaco, ah, makes sense. Makes yeah. sense. I don't, you, quantum I mean, physics. I, quantum physics, yeah, of course. And I'm all about quantum physics and energy and all that stuff. So, I mean, if, if this has been a phenomenal interview. Thank you so much um, for your wisdom and your time. I, I feel like uh, what you've given us today will do, do such, um, create such a space for anyone listening um, whether it's at home or at work, um, or especially in leadership of this uncertain time, I hope that leaders can look, listen, and realize we have all we have it all around us. It's just about opening your eyes or opening your body, like you said earlier, yeah. to absorb what really is good for all of us. It's it's here. We are going through a metamorphic shift in the world, and I hope that in this consciousness that we have the opportunity to be able to build um, spaces like we've created um, and to build things like those courageous events that um, allows people to connect on a level that, um, you know, we wouldn't probably be able to articulate otherwise. Yeah. I love that. I'm going to leave you with this. Yeah. We have to stop looking for answers. Mm -hmm. There are no answers. And uh, you already know the answer. Just go, just go inside and listen. It's inside of you, right? Just like close your eyes and then feel it and, uh, and trust that you already know the answer. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Well, I am going to, is there anywhere that people can, now your book, when is it coming out? Um, oh, it's, out yeah. <laughs> it's, it's out already? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
They can, the easiest way would be to go evedoucette.com. Okay. And I have my book and then you can link to our software products there too. Or you can just reach me on any social media, Eve Doucette. I'm there. Um, if you're in the Moncton region, I'll deliver the book. If you're farther away, I'll just send it to you. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I will, I will make sure that I have the links to both and okay. it'll, go in, it'll go in the show notes and it will go out. I'll let you know when uh, everything will be, be released. So again, thanks so much for your time. Um, so for me, I am going to think about what my courageous act is going to be. Cool. One, one, do one thing that scares you. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm going to have to think about that. What scares me? I'm going to have to think about that. And then I will let you know the next time we connect. So Eve, thanks so much. Have a great, uh, have a great day. Thank you, Roxanne. Okay. Take care. Thank thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxanderhajcom slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.